Well, in case you missed it over the weekend, there was a fascinating piece in Politico with the following counterintuitive title, America is running out of Muslim clerics, and that's dangerous. According to the article, the administration's travel ban, the supposedly fascist one that affects just six out of dozens of majority Muslim countries, is causing a perilous shortage of Islamic clergy in this country. That is terrifying, explains Politico, because, quote, with no imam to guide them, Muslims could soon turn elsewhere for direction with possibly radical consequences. Huh. It's kind of a weird thing to say when you think about it. We've been told for years that Islamic extremists are just a tiny minority within Islam. Foreign Muslims, our leaders have assured us again and again, are no more dangerous than native-born Americans. Probably less dangerous, actually, because native-born Americans are horrible, as they often point out. And yet, according to Politico, young Muslims may spontaneously become violent if they don't get the right kind of imams, even though their faith and culture have nothing to do with violence. Well, it's funny how you never hear the same reasoning applied to others, other faiths. There is, by the way, a shortage of Episcopal priests in this country. Have you noticed a wave of Episcopalianism terrorism? Has Chuck Schumer demanded we import more Buddhist monks just to make sure young Buddhists don't murder the rest of us? Probably not. Instead, they're telling us what they've always told us. It's completely safe to admit more Muslims into America and bigoted even to question that assumption. And by the way, if you do question it, Muslim extremists might kill you. Well, the tolerance police have a lot of power here in America, in case you haven't noticed, but they're even stronger in Canada. Just yesterday, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau delivered an official apology to gay and transgender Canadians for past state discrimination against them. But now teachers in Durham, Ontario, had to intend, attend an inclusiveness training course for the deep breath here, L-G-G-B-D-T-T-T-I-Q-Q-A-A-P-P community, which is apparently a community, that 15-letter acronym intended to encompass all sexual minorities. It may soon be required at schools. Stephen LeDrew is a former president of Canada's Liberal Party, and he joins us tonight. Stephen, thanks for coming on. Hi, Tucker. So what does this acronym mean specifically? What are the categories? Well, I mean, it's generally shortened to LGBTQ, uh, which is the communities, and there's a few extra ones they've added in there. Uh, but um, and no one goes by that. Maybe that's to teach kids uh, the alphabet or not. But generally, it's the, referred to, and the Prime Minister referred to it yesterday in the House of Commons during his apology, as LGBTQ. And, uh, and some people don't even know what it means, but they just know that means inclusiveness, it's a good thing, it's a question of tolerance. Right, uh, of course, but the, I guess what piqued my interest was the addition of new letters, each representing a new category, and uh, I'm not against it, kind of confused by it, and I just want to know what it means. Do you know what the acronym stands for? Do you know what those 15 well, groups are? what's the problem with it? You know, even I'm not, you don't I'm not know saying, what but hold on, slow down. I'm, no, slow down. Stop. I'm not saying there is a problem with it. I'm just, I'm just asking what it is, because defining the terms is the first step to understanding them and then accepting them. So what is it? Well, I mean, you've got in front of you, you have me at a disadvantage on that one, because I, to be very candid with you, as I said, L, everybody in Canada knows what LBGTQ, sometimes a two right. in the end, means. But that long one, quite frankly, until your producer showed it to me, I hadn't seen it, but then I looked at it. And you have all the definitions through there. Okay, that, then, then, then that, that, that's fine, but then why do you think it's a good thing if you don't know what it is? But what's the matter with it? If well, I don't know what the, I mean, look, I, I don't know. I mean, you could hand me a box and say there's something great inside, and my answer would be, okay, what is it? I mean, I don't pronounce Open things great until I know what they are, but you don't well, have that problem. So, let me, okay, I'll get specific with you. What's, and, okay. and this is meaningful because teachers are being taught this, kids will be taught it, and I think I have a right to non judgmentally ask what they're talking about. So, for example, what's two spirit? Well, two spirit sounds like there's someone they don't know whether they're, uh, you know, fish or fowl. They don't know whether they're, whether they're frick or frack. So they're clearly confused. And, you know, again, if you're confused, what better place to go than to be at school? So, I mean, all those categories, what? I'll, I'll bet you, Tucker, all those categories that are in that uh, long litany that you laid out there, I'll bet you that no one, well, maybe five people in all of Canada could lay out what exactly those are. But if someone feels that they are a better person, that they are more included in society, that there's someone else in society, some teachers, who understand them or who want to understand them, you know, that's what Canada's about. No, 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 but hold on, wait, no, I'm generous. sorry. I'm, okay, that's, I, look, I'm for people feeling included. I'm against meanness. I'm for politeness. But I also okay. believe in the right to ask simple questions and get direct answers. So if you're teaching kids about a group, 
I think it's fair to define what it is. I mean, you don't know, but you're willing to say, well, it's just it's great. And I'm baffled by that because maybe it's not great. Maybe we should find out what it is before we say that. No. Or is everything well, the teachers absolutely- group think up good by definition? I think you're absolutely right. Well, no, I'm not saying that everything the teachers group thinks up is good. I mean, they've had some uh, some very different things before. They had a, a measure last summer. And if in the if they were in the states, they would have said, no school could be called the George Washington School. They said, get rid of that first prime minister of Canada. So they aren't always on par. But on this one, and I, to be uh, very candid, as I said at the outset, I don't know what all those mean. I that's read the them point. Through. We all mindlessly go along. Them. But the point is we're all bullied. We're all afraid to ask honest questions like, what is this? And what bothers me is we don't know who makes up these categories. So there are 15 different groups in this, in this acronym did anyone pull right. them and ask, do you want to be included? Do the asexuals want to be with the allies and the pansexuals and the polyamorous? I mean, this well, I is mean, all made up. Nobody asked but Tucker, anybody. Tucker, and now it's Tucker, imposed on the rest everybody. of us. Everybody wants to be included. That's what this whole thing is about. It's society you want to be included. That's a social contract. So, you know, no one, I'm sure, went out and polled people. And they said out of the thousand people, if you are that fifth category in that long line of that long litany of names that you have. Right. No one's going to be polled on this thing. But it sounds to me that you're taking an issue with some teachers saying, let's try to bring it together. You no, already no, said no, I'm, you're, no, you're, you're totally missing it. I'm for bringing people together. I think there's Great. something inherently divisive about making up a, quote, community without asking anybody in the community if they constitute a community. And by the way, yeah, so but, like, but you, why would question? I mean, did anyone even ask, like, who made this up? Who's making these rules? We have to abide by them. So it seems fair to ask. Like, where did this come from? Well, it's not a rule, Tucker. That was uh, what you're reading is uh, something uh, that was created by teachers. They said, let's bring all the groups in. We have these names. I'm sure there is no poll on it. I know in the States, everything is run by polls. We don't do that in Canada. They said, you don't just because you don't care what the group, people think name. in Canada. Well, what, what were you saying? You don't do polls in Canada because you don't care what your population thinks. That doesn't that's not no, meaningful we do to you. Polls, but we don't we don't run everything by polls. What I understand well, you just in, impose in, uh, it by media. fiat on a passive population. Is that what you like? What, what's what point are you making? Are you are you picking on our prime minister? I, I'm not picking on. I'm pro Canada. I just came to ask simple questions, as we do in this country, hoping I would get a straightforward answer, not finding one, pressing forward a little more gently, politely, respectfully and getting nothing. Well, I'm sorry that you feel I'm giving you nothing because I'm giving you the honest truth. The honest truth is that most people in Canada would not know all those categories, but they would say, you know what? Even if there's 10 people out there in Durham County where this group was meeting, then that's a good thing. Bring them in. And if they're saying that they have some you know, sexual change or some ch- sexual option that I, I don't know about, well, let's all talk about it. And that's what that thing was for the media. It's for an invitation for everybody to come in. So, so what if somebody say, said, okay, what if, here's what I mean, doing. I guess what bothers me, I mean, look, this is taking place in Canada, so it doesn't affect me or most of our viewers directly. But I just sort of wonder, because free speech is not guaranteed, as you know, in your country, and people are in prison for saying unpopular things there. I wonder what would happen I to don't someone. Think so. well, well, you're wrong. They are. But I, I wonder well, what would happen. Then, what would happen to somebody who said, you know, I don't want I'm not interested in playing along with this. I don't know what it is. You don't know what it is. Leave me alone. Teach my kids to read and do math. That person would be dismissed as insensitive or bigoted or worse, wouldn't he? No, they wouldn't. I mean, because we're not judgmental like that. So you're saying from an American (laughs) point of view, that person would be dismissed as bigoted. But in Canada, they wouldn't be. They say, "Okay, fine. That's your opinion. Others have a different opinion. Oh, if only that were true. And you know what? I wish that were true. I mean, that's the country I want to live in. I want to live in a country where we can disagree. We don't call each other names. And we just sort of agree to disagree. But that's not the country you live in. And increasingly, that's not the country I live in. Oh, it, it is. It is the country that we live in, Canada. And there's a big difference between the United States and Canada. And that's one of the differences. Uh-huh. And I asked you, Tucker, to right. tell me who's in prison in Canada for, uh, for saying something wrong. We have a great People free are prosecuted for hate crimes in Canada for expressing things that are unpopular. And that's Canadian law. Mark Stein got sued no. over this. Yeah, okay. No, All right, you know Stephen, what? Stephen, we're uh, in a factual I'm... dispute in which you were in the wrong, but that's another show. I hope you will come back and we can talk about that in some detail. But in the meantime, thank you. Liberals say they love the poor. Of course they do. And liberals run every major city in this country. So why is there so much poverty in America's cities? Homelessness is out of control. Is there a connection between the politics? Crime doesn't pay. That's what they tell you in school. 
Though increasingly there's evidence that maybe it does in fact pay. Consider all those career politicians who somehow wind up rich in the end. And then there's Omar Kadar. If Kadar lived on your street, he'd probably be the richest guy in your neighborhood. How did he make his money? Well, first he joined the Taliban. During a firefight with U.S. soldiers in Afghanistan in 2002, Kadar threw a grenade that killed a Delta Force medic named Christopher Spear. For that, he went to Guantanamo Bay. He later pleaded guilty to murder there. Lucky for Kadar, he was born a Canadian citizen. So after being released from Gitmo, he sued the government of Canada for his imprisonment. And here's the remarkable thing. Canada settled with him. This month, Justin Trudeau's government awarded Kadar more than $10 million and issued an official apology for being mean to him. Prime Minister Trudeau later conceded he had not bothered to talk to Christopher Spears' widow before any of this. Instead, he defended the settlement as a win for human rights. Watch. I can understand Canadians' concerns uh, about the settlement. Uh, in fact, I, I share those concerns about the money. That's why we settled. The measure of a society, of a just society, it's not whether we stand up for people's rights when it's easy or popular to do so. It's whether we recognize rights when it's difficult, when it's unpopular. Michelle Rempel is a member of the Canadian Parliament and she joins us tonight. Michelle, thanks all for coming on. Thank you for having me. Is this a measure of the justness of Canada's society, do you think? Well, first of all, you know, for your viewers here tonight, I want you to know that most Canadians are absolutely outraged about this. Uh, you know, they're outraged because of the payment itself, how the payment happened, and the fact that, you know, the way that it's happened has probably preempted and prevented um, Tabitha Spear from seizing any of those assets. So, right. uh, you know... <laughs> assets belonging to the father of this man, to Kadar's That's father. correct. So, you know, I, I think while a lot of your viewers have just seen this statement, they should also know that most Canadians, I think, are quite outraged and quite disappointed by the state of affairs. It doesn't seem just. I mean, there are probably a lot of people in Canada, including some who've probably been mistreated legitimately by the Canadian government who could use ten and a half million dollars. How did this guy get it? Well, and the thing to recognize here is this was a settlement. This wasn't any sort of payment that was awarded by a Canadian court. This lawsuit that Mr. Cotter had filed was being litigated, and there was no court ruling, right? This was something that the government decided. And so what was disappointing for me as a legislator and many of my colleagues was that this decision happened after our House of Commons, which is you know similar to your Congress, yes. rose for the summer. So right now we're not sitting, right? We usually have an opportunity to ask questions like, why did this happen? What was the government's motivation? And that didn't happen. So I think that that's where there's a lot of concern about this particular decision, yes. that it's been made in a bit of a vacuum. And now we're just getting dribs and drabs so of why, what's happened. So why was it made? Why did the Prime you know, Minister do that? know, that's really a question for him. I think many Canadians would have preferred to have seen this play out in a court of law. The Prime Minister has said that this was done for some sort of, you know, financial reason to save money. But the reality is that this was a decision that was made by his government and not by a court of law. And I think that that's quite confusing and quite outrageous for many, many Canadians. So there's an effort online in Canada to raise money for the family of that's right. Christopher Spear, Tabitha Spear, but also yes. for the other soldier who was who was gravely wounded. That's right, uh, spearkids.ca. I think that the last time I checked, there was oh close to $200,000 that had been raised by the Canadian public. And what you have to understand too, that this is not like a partisan political issue. This is something that people who actually voted for this government are going, I'm not comfortable with this, right? You have to understand that Canada values, you know, the relationship that we have in terms of our men and women in uniform serving shoulder to shoulder with each other. And right. I think that there's a lot of people that are just going, how did this happen and why? And again, that's a question for our prime minister to answer. Why wouldn't he call the widow of Christopher Spear first? Again, you know, I'd, I'd I'm sure that's something that he should answer for, but I know that our former Prime Minister Stephen Harper has reached out to her. Um, I, I can't imagine being her right now and listening to all of this coverage and having this have those wounds reopened. Um, I think that we have to be cognizant about her and her like, compassionate to her and her family in, in the first instance here. And then, I, I, you know, to me, that's at the core. Of Canadian outrage over this. So, I mean, again, as long as we're passing out $10 million checks to people who say they've been wrong, this guy would not even be on the first hundred on that list. 
So you've got to wonder, was this a way of giving the finger to the United States? I think that this should have played out in a court of law. You know, Mr. Cotter has a appeal to his conviction that's pending in your government. He's had this case in front of the Canadian government. This is a very serious situation all around. You know, there's uh, our Supreme Court has said that his his human rights were violated. To me, as a legislator, I want the judiciary to make a decision on this. Yes. And Last that's what hasn't happened here. And I, I want to be perfectly clear.